My name is Nancy Gargula. I'm a member of the law school class of 1981, and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Notre Dame Law Association Board. So what an exciting time to be a Notre Dame lawyer, and, and what a momentous occasion in Notre Dame Law School's history that we celebrate tonight, the 150th year of the University of Notre Dame Law School. This is a time to appreciate the people who built a great law school at the heart of our ladies' university. And it's also time to think about the future of the law school. We can see the law school's future tonight in this room, in our students who have joined us for the celebration. Welcome to all of our students, these talented, hardworking women and men. They're embracing and carrying on the Notre Dame tradition of educating a different kind of lawyer. Also gathered here tonight are alumni, including members of the Law School Advisory Council and the Notre Dame Law Association, who have guided and supported the law school and our students for decades. We have faculty and staff here this evening who work day in and day out to prepare the next generation of Notre Dame lawyers. And deserving of a special round of applause are two of our former deans who are with us tonight, Patty O'Hara and Father David Link. And in a few moments, we're going to hear from Notre Dame Law School's newly appointed dean, Marcus Cole. But first, but first, as we begin our program, let's take a moment to give thanks. Reverend William Beauchamp, the law school's chaplain and a member of the law school class of 1975, will lead us in prayer at this time. Let us pray. Just and merciful God, you have blessed this law school with your good gifts and your loving care. You sent your spirit to be among us, and you bring us together to share in your goodness and to be mindful of your love. You have blessed this law school with outstanding young men and women who have come to, be what, who have come to us with dreams goals, and aspirations. You have blessed all of us with many good gifts that we might generously serve you. You have blessed us with faith that we might always trust in you. Most of all, you have blessed us with your son that we might come to understand how much you love us. We gather in celebration and thanksgiving for the 150 years of this law school's existence. We look to the past and the many things that have been accomplished to the many dreams and aspirations that have been fulfilled. We look ahead to the future, to dreams still to be realized, to new dreams, new beginnings, and accomplishments. Continue to watch over Notre Dame Law School that knowledge and wisdom may be increased among us. Bless this day all who teach and all who learn here, that their minds will be open to truth, to the ideals and principles that come from you. Bless both faculty and students that they may always look to you, their God, the source of all truth, the giver of all wisdom. Bless all of us this evening as we gather in your name. May it be a time of strengthening the bonds that bind us together as a community of scholars and students, preparing to serve you by helping to bring justice and peace to a world in desperate need of uplifting and hope. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and through the intercession of his mother, Notre Dame. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Beauchamp. I now welcome to the podium the Reverend Gerard Olinger, a triple domer and member of the law school class of 2004. <laughs> Since 2018, Father Olinger has served as the university's vice president for mission engagement and church affairs. 
and he will introduce the law school's new dean, Marcus Cole. Well, thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And I'd like to welcome everyone gathered here this evening to bark Notre Dame's 150th year. It's important to recognize anniversaries like this, not simply to count the years, but to celebrate people. The people who established Notre Dame's law program in 1869, and the following generations who built not only one of the nation's top law schools, but one that is proud of its unique mission to educate a different type of lawyer. I'm humbled to be part of this great legacy. In the past 150 years, Notre Dame's law school has been led by just 10 deans. I'm honored tonight to introduce you to the law school's 11th dean, Marcus Cole, who began his term as the, as the Joseph A. Matson Dean and Professor of Law on July 1st. Dean Cole grew up in Pittsburgh, earned his bachelor's degree in applied economics at Cornell, and his JD at North, Northwestern. Before becoming a law professor, he clerked for Judge Morris Shepard Arnold on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit and practiced law as a commercial litigation associate with Mayor Brown in Chicago. In 1997, he joined the faculty at Stanford Law School, where he taught courses in bankruptcy, banking, contracts, and venture capital. He held two endowed chairs and served for five years as associate dean for curriculum and academic affairs. But as you're about to hear from Dean Cole himself, he's been a lifelong Notre Dame fan, and this is truly a homecoming for him. In fact, let me offer one small story about who our new dean is. Marcus asked to begin his tenure as dean with a mass in the law school celebrated in the reading room. Father John Jenkins, our president, presided. Marcus's brother, Max, a priest from the diocese in Ohio, preached a beautiful homily about the need for us to be salt and light in the world. And the room was full of students, faculty, staff, and alumni. Marcus's desire to begin his tenure as dean with the celebration of mass is an illustration of his love of the mission of Notre Dame and his intentionality in beginning this new role. Please join me in welcoming home Dean Marcus Cole. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you all so very, very much. It's, I, I, it's, I, I can't even believe I'm here. This is amazing to me. Um, I spent so many Saturdays out in that stadium as a fan and to be able to look out there. And 150 years, I get to be the dean who celebrates 150 years, the oldest Catholic law school in America. 150 years, and only 10 deans before me. 10 deans in 150 years. So when I heard that the first time, when Father John told me that I would be the 11th dean in 150 years, I can do math. I'm thinking, I got this gig for 15 years. <laughs> and then he explained to me uh, that if it weren't for Father David Link, um, I would be the 17th or 18th dean <laughs> of, of this law school. So he, he ate up about three or four terms. Um, but I'm so delighted to be here. In fact, this is, a, this is truly a dream come true for me. I, um, as, uh, as Father uh, Olinger uh, told you, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I grew up in a very poor family. Um, uh, we lived in the Terrace Village housing projects of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, our family was so poor that uh, our parents uh, had uh, me and my older brother uh, deliver newspapers in the mornings to help uh, make ends meet. And in fact, my mom told us we had two jobs. One was to deliver newspapers every morning, and the other was to serve as altar boys at Mass at St. Agnes Church uh, in uh, the Hill District in Pittsburgh uh, every Sunday. But on fall Sundays, fall Sundays were special because uh, what we would do is get up as early as we possibly could before the sun was even up to deliver our newspapers. And we would rush 
deliver our newspapers, and then rush to St. Agnes to serve at the very first mass in the morning uh, as altar boys. And then from there, we would rush home because on Sunday mornings in the fall, we could catch the rebroadcast of the Notre Dame football games from the day before. And those were the only football games we cared about. Those were the only football games that we watched. And when we were little boys, my brother and I made a pact with each other that when we grew up and went to college, there was only one place for us to go, that we were both gonna go to Notre Dame. Well, my older brother was the worst possible older brother you could ever ask for, <laughs> because he was perfect at everything. He was number one in his class, he was student council president uh, of our high school, he was captain of the soccer team. I think he only applied to one college. Uh, this was the only place he applied to, and he got in. Years later, when I applied to Notre Dame, I didn't get in. I didn't keep our pact. I was devastated. I couldn't believe it. So I had to settle for my fallback school, Cornell University. <laughs> And I'm, I'm glad I went to Cornell. I met my wife there, of, uh, my wife Angie. We've been married for 31 years. Um, and I wouldn't have met her if I hadn't gone there. So I'm glad I did. I, I think it was part of God's plan. Um, but um, I, I, I really wanted to be here. And so when uh, I did well at Cornell, uh, it, it came time for me to apply to law school. I applied here, and I got in. And I was overjoyed, except I also got into Northwestern, and the difference was that Northwestern gave me a full scholarship. And for a poor kid from Pittsburgh um, who really wanted to be here, I had no choice, which is one of the reasons, by the way, I am so um, uh, uh, um, focused on financial aid for, for, for students because I don't want any student to ever, <laughs> thank you, I don't want any student to ever have to face the choice of denying the place they want to be uh, the way I had to. So I went to Northwestern, and again, I did well there. Uh, and I clerked on the Eighth Circuit and practiced law in Chicago. And then I went into law teaching, and I went to Stanford. And I taught at Stanford, uh, as uh, Father Jerry said, for 22 years. And I loved Stanford. It was a great place to teach. Uh, it was a great place to live. It, it, it had everything I wanted except it wasn't Notre Dame. And when I finally got the call from uh, Father John uh, about this opportunity, um, this is the one place that I could leave Stanford for. It's the only place that I would leave Stanford for. Uh, and so I talked it over with Angie, and she said, if this is what you want, let's, let's do it. And then when I finally got the job, um, we knew that Stanford was going to announce that I was the new dean here the next morning. Uh, and so once that announcement was made, we knew our teenage boys were going to hear from their friends um, that I had gotten this job. And so we wanted to sit them down and, and tell them ourselves so that they didn't hear it from their friends, they heard it from us. And then, you know, they're teenagers, so our thought was they're going to be thinking to themselves, how does this affect me? Um, but that wasn't their reaction. My oldest son looked at us and he looked at me and he said, Dad, isn't it amazing that God has finally given you the thing you've wanted all your life? And he was right. I've always wanted to be here and now I finally am. Now, it feels like it took 150 years. <laughs> um, but I'm happy that it worked out this way. And I'm happy that it worked out this way because I love this place and I have a view of what this place is and should be. And to understand that view, I need to explain a story uh, about a church in a very poor community in San Diego, California. The church is, uh, is uh, in a parish in a very poor neighborhood called, um, the, the, the church's name is uh, Christ the King. And um, the parishioners of Christ the King wanted to uh, erect a statue of Jesus in front of their uh, church. 
And so they saved money for years. They had bake sales and fundraisers in order to save enough money to erect a statue of Jesus in front of their church. And finally, the day came where they were going to have an unveiling of the statue. And so they organized a big fiesta to celebrate the unveiling of the statue of Jesus. And they did. They had a great celebration. But the very night after they unveiled the statue, the statue was vandalized. Someone painted graffiti all over the body of Jesus, and someone took a hammer and broke off both hands of the statue. The next morning, when the community saw the statue, they were devastated. They didn't know what to do. They got together and cleaned off the graffiti, but they didn't have the money. They barely had the money to erect the statue in the first place. They didn't have the money to replace it or even to repair it. The pastor of the parish, Father Robert Fabrini, had an idea. His idea was to erect a plaque at the base of the statue that is still there today. If you went to Christ the King in San Diego, you can see the, the, the plaque at the base of the statue. And the plaque reads, I have no hands but yours. And that's how I think of us. I think of us as Notre Dame lawyers, as God saying to us, I have no lawyers but you. There's a lot of work to be done out there. And it's going to call on lawyers who are competent, but also caring. Lawyers who are not just good lawyers, but lawyers for good. And that's what I think we, we mean when we talk about a different kind of lawyer, a lawyer who's a Notre Dame lawyer. So I am so blessed to be here, to finally be in the place I've always wanted to be. I'm so blessed to be surrounded by so many great people like you. And I want to thank you for helping us all celebrate the history and the future of this wonderful law school, Notre Dame Law School. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. So thank you, Dean Cole, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for supporting the law school. I hope you'll stay, enjoy some more food and some beverages, and remember that the law school's homecoming events continue tomorrow. We have an open house at the Notre Dame Clinical Law Center from 9 to 11, and of course our homecoming tailgate from noon to 3 on the DeBartolo Quad. I would also ask that you all please do a little sun dance between now and tomorrow. So with that, go Irish and enjoy. Enjoy.